I'm going to get us started, uh, start by thanking you all uh, for coming. I'm Susan Haithwick. I'm a medical geneticist uh, working in the NBI disorders now for 28 years. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, so ask Allison and then Kirsten to introduce themselves. Many of you know Allison from your travels, but here she is in the flesh. Yeah, I'm Allison. I think I hope you all know me by now. I think we're still maybe missing a couple families. So they'll they'll Is that trickle possible? in. They're That's trickling okay. in. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm a genetic counselor. I've been on the team for 16 years. I actually am the one um, who runs the PLAN study. So you interact with me on that if you're in the PLAN ready study. Just turn this back on. Close that door. Yeah. Um, hi, I am Kirsten Campbell. I am a pediatric palliative care physician actually right here in Charleston at the Medical University of South Carolina. Um, and I work with families starting from pregnant moms who have a baby that has been identified either from you know some type of testing um, that they have some type of genetic disease or sometimes they see something on an ultrasound that wasn't what you expected. Um, kind of working with the population from um, babies that are unborn all the way up through kiddos who have to transition to adult care, which is always hard too. Um, so we work with the whole spectrum of children and families who are facing some type of really um, significant medical challenge for their child um, and just helping families navigate the medical community, improving communication, providing support and helping to make decisions um, based on your family values and whatever your kiddo is facing. Um, and one of the things that you reminded me to say earlier is that um, some people have had experience with palliative care. Usually it comes with an adult family member. Um, and often it gets confused with hospice care. And um, pediatric palliative care is not that. Um, it doesn't mean it can't involve that. Um, but primarily we are looking forward to walk through an entire disease process um, with a family and really support them through that. Um, through the entire experience um, whenever we're able to do that. So if you do have access to a pediatric palliative care specialist, they're, they're amazing team members to add if you don't have one. I also want to ask the other physicians here to introduce themselves because um, you may not have time to interact with them here or today, although you may, but um, some of them will be able to be here for tomorrow and beyond. And some of you will have your kids examined in the training session uh, tomorrow, but I wanted to introduce them because you'll run into them over the course of the next few days, and they're here to learn, so they'll be interested to hear your stories, your kids' stories, and also maybe uh, have, give them a chance to examine your child if they haven't done it in the training session tomorrow, and then ask them questions and teach them. So maybe each of you could just introduce yourselves. I'm a fourth-year resident in child biology, So we had a couple of um, questions, a number of questions submitted um, at the front end. And then uh, we wanted to also talk to you a little bit about the PLAN uh, Ready Study and also give you an update on that and talk to you about um, <coughs> what we're doing here in terms of research. So we have our whole research team, or almost all. We left one person back in the lab to field the samples that we're mailing back today and tomorrow. So we will talk to you maybe towards the end of the session about uh, PLAN Ready, many of you know about it already, but about what we're trying to do here, uh, here at the meeting uh, in terms of uh, sample uh, collecting. So uh, uh, we 
we can talk about that towards the end. So some of the questions that came up, um, I think I have these on a slide, so let me pull the slide up. Some of the questions that came up, uh, questions Okay, so um, I'm going to start by talking about where the scientific community is, to the best of my knowledge. There's been a lot of work in PLAN over the course of the last, I'd say, two years in terms of the biology. What precisely is going on in the, um, in the biology of the disorder? And then talk to you a little bit about some of the therapeutics that are coming, the rational the more or less rational therapeutics that are, that are in, in various stages of development, some of which I know more about, others I know very little about. There may be activities, in fact, I'm sure there are activities in PLAN that I don't know about and you may know about, so forgive me. Um, I do try and stay up with what's going on across the spectrum, but it's a lot of diseases, it's a lot of biology, and it's a lot of scientists, and so it's, the good news is that there's more and more science going on and uh, it's get, getting hard, hard to stay abreast of all of it. Um, so one of the biggest um, advances, I think, it, it, that's come, come in the last uh, few years is uh, work by a group down at Baylor. Hugo Bellin is the lead um, scientist. He's a Howard Hughes-funded scientist, which is a level of science that is very, very high in the US. Um, he uh, works on uh, developing fruit fly models for many, many, many different neurodegenerative diseases, which is his, particularly his area of focus. His, his program is all about, uh, as soon as a new disease is discovered, he tries to make a fly model and figure out enough biology to think about therapeutics that can be, uh, for which there can be a rational uh, application, and then to show that those therapeutics do or don't have any, any effectiveness. He made a fly model for PLAN that um, looks pretty good, and that fly model has uh, uh, a, a, a difference in its biology that hadn't been recognized before. So there's the accumulation of a certain molecule called ceramide, uh, which is kind of a greasy molecule that um, we hadn't known before that this was accumulating um, in PLAN. We know that there's, uh, it's not the only thing accumulating. We know there, there's other, other molecules accumulating, but he showed that ceramide accumulates in his fly model and also in the cells of people with PLAN, and I'm using that term interchangeably with INAD, but I want to include sort of the whole spectrum. Um, and he showed that, that an, an FDA-approved compound called disipramine actually in the, in the fruit flies and in the human cells improved the ceramide accumulation, that is, it lessened the accumulation of the ceramide. Ceramide accumulation is not the whole story in PLAN, and that's important to know. Um, it may be an early disease change, which is something we're always interested in, because if you can figure out the early disease changes before a whole lot of other secondary collateral damage has happened, you can have a more impactful, uh, you can make a more impactful change, I think, to the disease process itself. Whether ceramide is early or not, I think is still open to discussion, but his work suggests that it may be an early molecule accumulating before some of the others are. Um, he gave this FDA approved compound, which used to be used back in the 80s maybe uh, for depression. It's one of the tricyclic antidepressants. It, it is no longer in common use, um, but it's an FDA approved compound, it's relatively inexpensive, it's been used in children and uh, historically for depression with, I would say, quite mixed results. And it's um, uh, got a fairly good safety profile. And so um, some of you um, received a letter from us. Um, so the, the question is, uh, you know, what's next? Should we go into the, into the mice? Should we go into humans? Should we do a clinical trial? What should we do next? And what um, we elected to do was two things. We elected to, in parallel, go into the mice. There's a very good mouse model in, uh, in the UK. So there's two mouse models of PLAN. One is much more INAD, and that's the, use, 
the UK model uh, that started in Japan. And the other is the, I would say, is a more PLAN or adult onset disorder, which is the model that's at uh, uh, Washington University in St. Louis. It's a, the model that was built by the, uh, the team there that they then shared with Paul Kotzbauer. The study, so we, uh, Paul may be doing a disipramine study in his PLAN model, but we actually advocated for the, UC, the UCL group in England to do a, PLAN, uh, to do a disipramine study because the mouse there is so much more, so much sicker earlier that we'd have, a, we'd have a readout much more quickly if it was showing any benefit. And so we're working with INAD Cure to explore the feasibility of their funding. Uh, that study, uh, mouse studies are expensive. Mice are more expensive than you'd think, given how hard we work to keep them out of our house. We actually have to pay a fair amount of money every day to keep them in a clean environment, to keep them fed, to have the vets check them, to, to uh, pamper them in ways we don't typically do for, uh, for mice. And so um, that project, I think, is at the uh, consideration stage for, for funding, but we think it's important to, uh, to do uh, because if we see no change in, in the mouse, uh, that I think that that's an important discovery. And if we see change, we'll know that pretty quickly, much more quickly than I think we would know that in, in the kids. In parallel with that, we decided, the OHSU group decided that we didn't have the bandwidth and, and there would be a tension in the community around doing a placebo, a double blind placebo controlled study of a, of a cheap, safe, FDA approved compound. For me to come to you with your children and say, here's placebo for six more months, whereas somebody else is getting disipramine, and you could go to your doctor and say, could you just give us some damn disipramine? That's gonna be a really hard trial to, to do. And, and ethically, it's, a, it's questionable whether that's actually the right thing to do. We decided that we um, didn't, we, we, we elected not to uh, cross that and instead elected to dis disseminate the best information that we could to the PLAN community, provide you with the information you needed to have a thoughtful discussion with your uh, individual care providers, and that you together with them could decide whether you wanted to try disipramine in your children. It means that we don't have a placebo-controlled, double-blind crossover study, whatever. We don't have that and won't have that uh, in PLAN, but you will have an opportunity to, to, to try things in your kids that, um, if that's your choice. Um, there's one family in Oregon that I care for and I will say that that family um, tried it and um, so their son has a, uh, maybe a juvenile PLAN phenotype, um, not full on INAD and um, his, his uh, and he was fairly far progressed in his disease um, he was no longer able to sit up or hold his head up, but he was bright and uh, visually interactive, and he had a beautiful smile and a uh, beautiful responsive smile. And um, he, his sleep patterns were very significantly disrupted by disipramine, and the family uh, tried to keep him on for, I think it was about two months, maybe even close to three months. And they just decided that it wasn't, even if it had some therapeutic benefit over the long term, that what they were losing in quality in the near term was not worth it. And so the single side effect they were seeing was disrupted sleep, and he seemed to be not just uh, having his sleep-wake patterns disturbed, but he seemed to be quite distressed at night. And that was too high a burden for them, and so they stopped the compound. And so one thing I would like to hear from you is if you have tried it, and maybe um, other families would like to hear it as well, um, I'd like to know um, if you're interested in talking about it, if you've elected to try it, um, if your family members have elected to try it, if you, kind of what you're hearing through the grapevine, and what your experience is, because if everybody comes forward and says, you know, my kid is unhappier than I've ever seen them, that is really valuable information for us to share with people who aren't here as information for, with which they can then make the best choice for their own family. But it's just, it's information that I, I think it's really important that we share with each other. So maybe I'll just stop for a moment and ask. Yeah, so we'll talk about it. Can I ask you to, um, so we are recording it, and uh, mm -hmm. just ask you to talk in the mic so that we capture all of the audio. Let me make sure that's on. 
Um, so <clears throat> this is Arya. Um, I'm Anil. This is Lena, my wife. Um, uh, our daughter's been on the Superman for um, so about three months now, right? Um, and we, you know, we we received this information through uh, Baylor College and um, and decided it was something worthwhile trying. Um, I think the biggest side effect we've seen so far um, is one that's probably um, the, the one that needs to be taken into account as being, you know, um, being cautious with is the, the um, high heart rate, um, the cardiac issues. Uh, so I think that's, that's the one thing that they're really looking at because um, she's part of the study with, uh, through um, Duke University. And um, so she's on 40 milligrams. We upped, we upped her um, from, we started at 20, then went to 30, then 40. Um, so I, I think that's the biggest thing that we've seen right now is, is the heart issues. We haven't seen um, anything related to her sleep patterns. I, we think her, her sleep patterns aren't always great, but I think that's really related to her digestive issues, yes. So, so you've seen an increase in her heart rate or a problem with her heart rhythm? Um, so her heart rhythm was, I, they were, the, the, the last time we had checked, uh, it was showing abnormal yeah. uh, uh, with our local doctors. Um, but we just had a follow-up done at the Duke University uh, just two days ago and, and it came out normal. So um, at this point, I think they're just upping the dose little by little. I think they want to see her at 80 milligrams eventually, mm -hmm. but just to see how she's tolerating it. And it seems it takes her a little bit, maybe about a month or so to adjust to the, mm -hmm. you know, increase in dosage. Okay. Um, so that's, that's, that's been our biggest concern. Um, she, she hasn't been any more moody or, or um, you know, and, and we, we see some of the, um, some of the comments on our on our Facebook group and uh, and different kids have different sort of reactions, but I think the biggest concern is the increase in heart rate and um, yeah prolonged QT. Yep. Um, yeah. So that's a known risk. Right. And, and it's 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 quite a significant risk. So right. I want to emphasize that it's the, the reason one of the. One of the important reasons, not the only one, but one of the important reasons that the, this this drug fell out of favor, particularly in um, in kids, it also it also was associated with worsening psychiatric disease in some uh, in some children. I think that's less of a co concern in the feline kids, although we're learning. We're child, all learning, think, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. yeah so it's uh, for us, um, we're continuing at this point. Um, because from what we understand is actually that particular concern, um, speaking with the um, doctor that's uh, running the trial, um, we asked what's, you know, what's the rate, you know, what's the percentage rate um, as far as that being a side effect. And they said it, you know, it's known to be 1% or less of the patients because this, I mean, obviously this medication has been on the market for quite some time. So, well, you know, based on the research, what kind of, you know, how many people are affected by that particular side yeah. effect? And they mentioned less than 1%. So that's so. in people who don't have PLAN. No, no, and we don't, we, we don't know the answer in right. people who and do P have PLAN. Obviously, so that's yeah. Obviously, yeah. So important they're, they're, they're sort of looking at that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the Duke, um, the Duke study um, being referred to is a three patient study? Two, um, currently, it's, it's there's a, two patients. I know they, yeah. they, they just recently received the clearance. <laughs> Well, they, they recently received an FDA clearance, I think, to go up to 20. Okay. Okay. So they are trying to do a, an open label study. Right. That is, everybody's on the compound and they're studying it. Yeah. Right. It's not okay. a double blinded yeah. study or anything, yeah. anything like okay. that. So. Does anybody else have uh, comments they'd like to make on disipramine? Yeah. Can we get, get you on mic? Do you want me to hold your baby? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Deborah. This is my husband, Antoine, and our son, Leo. Um, we actually, um, we actually were pushing to get um, Leo on um just to try it and to see we had nothing to lose, and we had his cells tested actually beforehand, 
and found out that it had the adverse effects on him. So we're actually happy to share that today because for the other children that are actually on it, we think that's important for other families to know that maybe it's not helping their ch child. Yeah. We don't. Who, who did the studies? Uh, Hugo Bellin. Okay. So he uh, took, took the cells from Leo mm -hmm. and asked the question, is, are we seeing a, ch a change in ceramide accumulation when we applied disipramine to those cells specifically from Leo? And he did not see that. And ours as well. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, he was shocked. Um, and then of course they, he tested the RT-001, which he on to see that you know, it is doing something. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, say something? <laughs> she, to she just wants to eat it. Other, other, yeah. Matt? So um, Josie was put on uh, 10 milligrams, which is uh, not much for a child of her size. And uh, we noticed uh, pretty immediately afterward that uh, constipation became an even uh, bigger issue mm. than it already is. And uh, we decided to stop uh, using it because um, we, you know, we're in the groove, things yeah. are working, things yeah. are flowing for her, and so um, we didn't want to uh, throw things off uh, for a, an unknown amount of yeah. benefit. Yeah, I will say that that was also a com complication for the young, young boy in, uh, in Oregon who's younger than Josie, but um, he's maybe seven or six, or seven. six in that age range, and um, was in his groove, and it, it, the constipation for him is a huge issue in his quality of life, hour by hour, day by day. Yeah, so thank you. Yeah. Any other comments on disipramine? Anybody? Um, any other, anything else you want to add? Yeah, so do you want to introduce yourself, Jenny, just to the Hi, gang? sorry, uh, Jenny Wilson, Pediatric Neurology at Oregon Health and Science University. Um, I uh, do tone and movement disorders and neurodevelopment and then some other things too. So Jenny's been uh, joining us in our NBIA clinic and um, le learning just uh, by being able to examine a whole lot of people coming through. So we're trying to, at this meeting, we're trying to disseminate knowledge and training uh, physicians and, and trying to get a larger uh, cohort. Um, so the other topics were um, the retrotope study. So I'm gonna actually turn it back to you. Um, we were not able to get, we and others um, in other countries were not able to get to our satisfaction uh, sufficient safety data from the uh, Retrotope company. So these are the people who have a compound called a deuterated polyunsaturated fatty acid or uh, for those friendly with them, a DPUFA. Um, and they were, um, they were proposing this as a rational therapeutic um, in PLAN, and it may be, but the cl clinical trial design that m we and others in the community felt was a more appropriate trial design than what they were proposing to do uh, was to compare their PUFAs with the PUFAs that anyone can buy for a few dollars in the, from the grocery store, and they didn't want to do that study. And so there were just some things, you know, we have to always be making decisions about collaborations, what's in the best interest of moving the field forward, and we felt that for us to be involved in the retrotope study of DPUFAs, it was not the best investment of our time. Um, it sounds like they've proceeded, um, you'll tell me, um, uh, uh, with, uh, either enrolling individuals, or I don't know if they're still at an individual IND uh, level, but if they've opened a trial. Can you, Lena, can you update us? Yeah, so they, so they, they have been uh, enrolling patients mm -hmm. um, for uh, maybe almost, almost a year now, I think, um, or it could be a little bit less than that. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, um, they, uh, you know, we, we hear a lot of positives and negatives, um, you know, um, from families whose kids are on, are on the drug. Um, you know, they did move forward with the trial, so I think that, um, you know, we don't know really, yeah. as far as data is concerned, I don't think anything's been yeah. kind of And everybody's yet. on the compound, and nobody's on a, nobody has a placebo, and right. nobody has an un, 
a non-deuterated PUFA, is that true? That's what yeah. I understand it, yeah. yeah. That's what I understand it to be. Yeah. yeah. Full disclosure, I, I work for Retrotope. Oh, okay. <laughs> it'd be good. It'd be good for you to identify so yourself. I, I, I didn't Tell want us to, your name. I didn't want this to get too deep without uh, full disclosure. Yeah. Um, um, my name is Mark Maday. I'm a cardiologist, yeah. a, adult cardiologist. So I, I, I know less about this than just about anybody else in this room, I think. But um, we, um, we have, um, we, we have one active patient. Whom I've seen movies of, but I've never met in person, um, and um, and one other uh, young subject who has completed an open label uh, expanded access protocol, and there are currently 19 uh, subjects around the world on RT001 in an open label, mm -hmm. um, non-comparative study. Mm -hmm. um, the, and probably the maximum duration that anybody's been on it is approximately three months, and we anticipate a minimum exposure of a year per subject. Okay. Six months. Probably. Yeah. You know more than I think. Yeah. He's on it six months. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. This is Leo. Yes. Oh, Leo. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. So um, before there was a retroto, maybe. Before there were DPUFAs uh, being touted as possibly having a therapeutic benefit, the community, um, we and others, Paul, recommended polyunsaturated fatty acids. So we still do so. There's a conceptual basis for that. Um, and so if the deuterated PUFAs um, hit it out of the park, why wouldn't, why wouldn't you compare it with uh, Polyunsaturated fatty acids. Is there an explanation for that other than the well, usual? Why you, yeah. Why wouldn't you do a why wouldn't you do a, a side by side of D and non D PUFAs? Well, it, I mean, just the practical standpoint that you pointed out with dizipramine, uh, uh, it's very difficult to do a controlled trial in this disease because there's so few subjects. So, okay, so the study you're doing isn't controlled in any way? The well, it's a controlled rated. study, but it's, not, it's, it's open label. Yeah, okay. So I'm just gonna put it out there that the question is unanswered about whether polyunsaturated, deuterated, or non-deuterated have a therapeutic role in the disease. So it's, it's, it's one of those questions may be answered by, by the company. The other one um, hasn't been answered. It's a harder one to get, get uh, study. Yeah. So um, when Hugo analyzed Leo's cells. Speak into the he, microphone. When, when Hugo analyzed Leo's cells, he did two things. First, he was looking to see naturally about the disepramine um, and came to the conclusion that it would not be helpful to Leo. But he also looked at the RT001 and said it was, on a cellular level, it is helping him. Mm -hmm. what, what we don't see is outwardly. Yeah, so, it's, um, so what's happening in a dish may or may not be reflected in the child in your arms. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Correct. But it's something. But it's, but yes. it's something. And, and what we, yeah. and what we yeah. don't know and, and so we're, we're keeping it, certainly not hurting him in any way, and we feel that maybe he'd be worse by now. Yeah, I don't I, think you can say that you don't, I, 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 you need to be careful about the safety, nobody's done a safety trial of deuterated PUFAs in PLAN, so n nobody has any data. It may or may not be safe, I just think it's important to state that okay. out loud. We don't know that. Okay. Yeah. We haven't seen any yeah, that's, negative. Yeah, that's good. That's, that's important. We, we haven't seen any negative. Yeah, so that's helpful all. anecdotal information. Yeah. So. Did you? Yeah. So uh, my son Yusuf's on it, and um, he's been on it three months now. And uh, so it's early. So what we've noticed is that um, um, some things are that one thing that some of the things we've noticed have been positive. Um, 
at one point we noticed that he, when he was in this, his, you know, in this car seat in the van, his head would always be flopping down, and he hasn't been able to lift it for a year or so. But one time his head flopped up, and he was able to prop it back up. Okay. We don't know if that's going to be continue or not, but that was like a. I haven't seen him do that since because we we haven't you know we we haven't been testing that. But yeah. um, one thing for sure that we've kind of noticed is, and we don't know. Again, this it does some things may go away with this disease, like for example, he used to have nystagmus, and that kind of reduced, and yeah. that was before any depuff or anything like that. Yeah. So one thing that was there that's less is his spasms. Uh -huh. At the time he took it in the last three months, he has less, he used to have a spasm every like two minutes or so, or, and now he has less of that. Yeah. But it's really early, and I can't tell, because like you said, like we can't, um, it's, it's slight, and I don't know, um, so it's really, really early. I can't really There's tell. There's also, of course, the changes of disease over time yeah, that you're also trying to sort out. That's what I'm trying to sort out, too, yeah. right, too. So. Can I ask, of the three families we heard from, are your kids, were your kids on regular over-the-counter PUFAs before? No. Uh, so we, we've seen you, I know that we recommended it, but we... We, were, we did it initially, yeah. and then bef well before we took it, we, we stopped taking it. Yeah, we, we did was take that, Was that by, by choice? By choice. We only did it for like a few months okay. at, the time, at that time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, is, is she still on? Okay. Okay. So that's, a, that's another change. So you, you haven't done just the adding of the deuterated PUFAs. You've actually stopped with the regular PUFAs. So, yeah. I think they've asked us to, in, in the study, to drop the fat content as well. Yeah. So that they, they've asked us to drop even, yeah. even the, yeah. we had already dropped our, the, um, providing oil, like fish oil and all that, but yeah. in terms of uh, fat content, I think they've asked us to drop okay. that as well. <clears throat> I'm learning as I go here, and I'm not a medical person at all, but um, it was explained to us that the RTO1 is, John, is modified in a way to target hitting the brain and the area that it needs to get to, as opposed to just taking something that goes through the bloodstream and may may not meet that blood-brain barrier. Mm. And that was the main difference, as opposed to just taking an over-the-counter drug, is mm -hmm. how I understood it. And who, who provided you with that information? H how did you come to know that? Oh, God, now you're asking me a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, because what I, I, I asked early on, and I can't remember now who okay. said, but I asked why not, mm, that was my, why not just get a high quality, yeah. And that some whoever I asked this question to was was and that was also why RTO one is considered a drug because and not just an oil because it it had to be altered to target the brain. So yeah. So I uh, I'm not aware of any scientific any in the public domain scientific evidence that it is any more targeted to the brain than anywhere else, except that polyunsaturated fatty acids are really important for your brain. So PUFAs are rich, your brain is rich in PUFAs, and actually your globus pallidus is super rich in PUFAs. <coughs> but whether it's the deuterated form is any different or not, I will say that if a compound is a drug, it's protectable in a way with a patent, and it's reimbursable in a way that an oil from a, as a supplement isn't. And so insurance doesn't pay for supplements, but they pay exorbitant prices for drugs. So I don't know if that was a motivation or not. Yeah. Did, uh, Sushetta, did you have? OK. Um, I don't want to spend too much more time, so I'm going to move us on. Um, Feeling ready, fostering. So let me talk about the general concept of fostering communication collaborations, and then I'm going to up update you a little bit on the gene therapy work that's going on that I know about. Um, so again, I've been working in this disorder, group of disorders, for almost 30 years. We have gotten, we, the scientific group, has gotten to where we are through collaborative work and through sharing of resources. It's still a relatively small scientific field, and 
one of the ways that we can encourage early career uh, physician scientists and scientists into the field is by providing them with research resources. Cell lines, animal models, uh, uh, clones, uh, those kinds of things. Um, uh, and so we have taken a very collaborative approach, generally with fully open collaborations. Uh, Sunita's here, we've tried to collaborate as openly as we can with the FON studies, uh, referring patients uh, to her for that um, study, and we've done that with, uh, with uh, investigators around the world. There are a very small number, two, maybe three people in the world that we've collaborated with and had very bad experiences with, and we've elected not to continue working with them. The otherwise, we are fully open and sharing with just about everybody. So um, put that out there. When the gene was discovered, it was discovered through a collaboration with the UK group, Eamon Mayer's group. Uh, an early career physician scientist in that laboratory, then Manju Kurian, uh, sort of uh, saw the patients, got interested in the disease, and has now, where uh, Eamon wasn't able to take the work forward, Manju's taken the work forward. And it's her group in the, in the UK that are, in my view, I don't know what, what exactly where Paul is with it, but the UK group is the furthest along with the, the gene therapy work. They have a, an early affected mouse. They have a very powerful readout. They have the gene in the vector that they want. They have uh, changes, improvements in the mouse from the gene therapy delivery. They have a paper that is either in review or, or in some draft, at some draft stage for public, uh, uh, for publication, which is, again, it's what we do in order to put information out into the public domain so you can see it, your doctors and scientist friends can see it, and you can look at it uh, critically. We publish our data. That's one of the differences between the academic groups and many of the, um, many of the for-profit organizations, the pharmaceutical companies. Some of them publish, but many of them don't. They keep it as trade secrets, which is a, a business benefit. Um, the UK group has uh, applied for and received very favorable um, uh, reviews to go to the next step, which is safety data as a step before moving into humans. This is what's required of, uh, of them by the UK regulatory agency. So why can't they just go from mouse to human? It's not the doctor's decision, it's the regulatory agency's decisions. And is that right? It's, a, it's an ethical discussion that everybody should be having, including us, including you, with the regulatory agencies. Is that the right order? Because it may be that we then know it's safe, but we're two to three to four to five years down the pike. And for some of your families, that's too long a time to wait. So, um, so I just put that out there. It's not the doctors making the, de the decision, it's the doctors working within a regulatory framework that, uh, that requires maybe more flexibility than it has currently. The work in the UK, when, as it advances to human trials, will very quickly also open with human trials in the US. And we are um, hoping to be um, partnering with the UK group on those clinical trials. Um, I know in parallel, Paul Kotzbauer at uh, Washington University in St. Louis, again, he has a later onset, more mildly affected mouse with mutation in PLA2. He's got a different, it's gotta be a different gene therapy approach, uh, just because they're never identical. Um, and I know that he's working towards uh, 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 an outcome study. I don't know uh, precisely where he is. I actually, Paul was supposed to be here. Um, he's uh, very much to his disappointment, uh, was shut out of uh, flights because of the weather problem. He was really, really uh, unhappy about that. I got an email from him late last night. Uh, he couldn't get on a flight today until tonight. So he will be here tonight. And I'd encourage you, if you want to know more about the gene therapy work and the small molecule work that is going on in his lab, to corner Paul and, and uh, talk to him about, um, about his own work. He may be much further along with the gene therapy work than I know, but um, I, know, I know that that work is going on in parallel. Um, so can you give us some kind of timeline for UK? 
um, estimate. I'm not going to hold you to it. I would say it, that just... we would be in human trials in about three to five years if everything looks safe. And I know that that's, I know, I know. That's an eternity in a child with PLAN's life. I know. Yeah. One of the, um, one of the questions you switch, um, we get asked. One of the questions that we were curious about was, you know, from what, correct me if I'm wrong, from our understanding that uh, the particular gene therapy that Dr. Kurion's working on is really geared towards uh, children, you know, symptomat uh, asymptomatic children. Um, but what about have they been able to do anything as far as, you know, children that are symptomatic? Yeah, so, so they designed a mouse study with the idea to try and, and see, uh, so whenever you're trying to develop a therapeutic, you want to do an experiment that has the potential to give you a signal, right? You want to see a signal, any signal. And so you set up that experiment, you design that experiment to be as powerful as it can be. And the most powerful way that they decided to do this, it was actually done by Dr. in Dr. Rahim's lab in, uh, in a collaboration with Dr. Kurian, was uh, it was a neonatal, a newborn baby mouse dosing, and then seeing a difference in the trajectory of their uh, progression over time, seeing that the treated mice, the ones that received virus with the gene in it versus virus with no gene in it or with a filler to see how they changed over time. If they had done that at, uh, so these mice get very sick very fast. If, and so doing that uh, much later is actually, it's kind of hard to do. So they can do it, they could do it later, but how that would translate to the kids, are we reversing the disease, those kinds of things, I think would be difficult to do. So that is one conceptual difference in the two models that Paul could actually treat the animals at probably six months, right? Because of the and model. See okay. if, and see if he can change the outcome in those mice. Um, but once he does that experiment, so these guys had a readout within about three weeks. When Paul does that, he's not gonna have a readout for probably at least another six months. Mm -hmm. And so he's gotta get enough animals, do enough biologic replicates, et cetera, et cetera, to actually see it. These guys were going for the fast, is there evidence of it working? And then they will do it, probably the initial clinical trial would be in as young a baby as we can identify. Uh, but how is that? Typically you get the diagnosis once the symptoms, you know, once you start yeah. seeing the symptoms. So yeah. how, how do you determine that? Yeah. So. Um, uh, whole exome is, so symptoms would probably be present or it would be an unaffected or a, a unaffected but mutation positive sibling in a child, in a family with, with one child. I, I'm not, I'm not um, defending it as the, the, this great thing. I'm simply talking to you about how I would say one way that, that, that a gene therapy can be developed. You know, there, there are other ways mm -hmm. that it could be developed. It may be that uh, a child d diagnosed at 11 months will also be able to enroll in the, in the study. Um, we just, with, with the uh, vector choice and the, um, the way that they've done the mouse studies, the, um, the access to the brain, the blood-brain barrier changes from newborn period to an older human and animal, and that that was part of, again, they were going for the big signal. Mm -hmm. so, so your best chance of getting it in the brain is neonatal, and er, so, so therefore early, and that's why they did it that way. Um, it does make it more difficult to translate into a human study. You're making a very good point. Um, will they be able to identify and enroll? Will we be able to identify and enroll those patients? I, d I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, how do you create a protocol for something like that when you the patient group is not, you know, new, how many newborn yeah. babies are you going to yeah. find? Well, it doesn't have to be, they don't have to be exactly newborn, but as young as possible. Wow. And, and it may be that when we sit down with the whole mouse data set, which I, I and others haven't yet had a chance to digest, mm -hmm. uh, when we sit down with the whole story, 
we may determine that that's not actually a feasible study. It's just n never going to work for the reasons that you're raising now, that the ascertainment is too late for that. And we need to think differently about how this trial is going to be designed. Those discussions are beginning now. So they're, they're trying to get uh, regulatory approval and funding for this next big stage of the safety. And once they begin that, I think that's the right time for us to be talking about the human studies and, and probably engaging families in those discussions. So, sorry, one more question. So are they going to get, a, get industry involved in this at, at a certain point? Yeah, so um, they're exploring options with uh, their hospital and university now about whether that there will be a, a kind of a university-based uh, in, industrial uh, organization uh, spin-off mm -hmm. or whether, so what, what they're intent on is controlling the price of this because they're not willing to do the SMA thing, which frankly, you know, the SMA, there's a gene therapy now for SMA that costs, I don't know, two million something. 2.5 million is a lot of money, but to tell you the truth, to take care of a child with SMA costs a whole lot more than 2.5 million, and so it's kind of a bargain. However, that said, drug prices are a problem in the US, and they want to control both the, the human studies and the pricing, and so they are not willing to sort of just hand it off. They want to be involved for the long term, but there will be some uh, industrial partner in it in some form as they go forward. And they've actually taken quite a lot of interest in the Spoonbill approach mm -hmm. because they have a similar, um, I would say, ethic around drug pricing that has that we've initiated in, in PCAM. So I talked a little bit about fostering communication and collaboration. So there was a question, I think, from your family about how do we get all the doctors talking and kind of on the same page and uh, et cetera. Um, we, we do talk, um, but we don't talk as much as we should. And the PLAN community, particularly the PLAN scientific community, is really small. So. Um, the other disorders have some advantages in that they relate to more common diseases. And um, there's been, been more scientists kind of coming in and getting interested in them. PLAN should have that scientific interest because it actually is quite relevant to diseases that are really quite common. But it hasn't for, for reasons we can debate. Um, one of the things that helps us share information is uh, uh, regular scientific meetings. We do have a uh, usually biannual uh, NBIA scientific meeting, but I will tell you that to my dismay, it's not surprising, but we present work only when it's really quite mature. That is, when I'm ready to publish, that's when I'm ready to talk. And do I talk to uh, Paul about what's going on in my laboratory, uh, even new ideas I have? Um, we just, we haven't kept up with each other to that level. Um, would that be advantageous? Yeah, it probably would be. It probably would be. And so having some kind of a more regular um, symposia, and I think actually something that's dedicated to PLAN, and I think something that actually brings in scientists who should be more interested in this disease and gets them there to hear about it and learn about it and connect with other other scientists and find, okay, you can get resources. People will give you things that will al allow your, your laboratory to move towards them. Those would all be stimuli for uh, both better communication, collaboration, and for, uh, for uh, bringing more scientists into the field. I feel like I've been talking a lot here, so I'm going to just ask if anybody else has anything they want to add to anything I've said. <laughs> anybody, anywhere? Yeah, one question. So, <coughs> um, regarding, so, sorry, uh, first I apologize. I'm not uh, English fluent. I'm French <laughs> from Paris, but I'm going to try to be uh, clear. Now, just uh, we were talking about the, the daisy priming before and uh, the analysis that uh, Hugo uh, did on uh, Leo's fibroblast. And uh, so, very simple question. Did he share this result with you directly or not? Because you're asking us uh, what we, well, what yeah. we, just what we share, but yeah. we spend, 
we we, uh, we had two call, two conference calls with uh, Hugo Belen, which is a uh, which who is a very nice uh, person. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it was, I think, one and a half hour uh, conference call each time. Yeah. He went through all the details, yeah. so it reminded me my old lesson from school, but <laughs> a bit tough to understand. Uh, and the last conference call we had, where, where when he shared his results regarding uh, Leo's fibroblast, he explained very in detail everything. But to be honest, we are not able to yeah. share that with you. Yeah. I mean, we didn't understand everything. So. Sure. For example, uh, bon, I'm, I'm surprised I don't understand exactly how it works, but it would be more beneficial for, for you, for yeah. the whole community, yeah. that he shared this result with you. Yeah. Because. So yeah. oftentimes that would be shared in a publication. I, I don't know if that's his intent or not. Um, you know, he happens to have a, a connection with my university, and I think he's probably uh, coming to my university, so he'll be around the corner and we can talk. That's different, mm -hmm. but um, we, we don't have a, an active dialogue uh, now. Would that be helpful? Sure, it always would be helpful. Um, there's, no, there's, no, um, there's no barrier per se, it's just a matter of prior, you know, priorities and what, what's, got the, what's the most benefit. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, what's the most benefit? Um, it's not, yeah, it's not, it's, it's none of those. It's, it's, uh, uh, you know, I have, I have 300 things I have to do in the next four hours. Okay, probably not 300. But I probably do have 16 things I need to do in the next four hours. And, I, and it's, it's about, I'm not, I'm not saying that PLAN is not important because it is, right? We are here spending days but is my talking to Hugo going to move the field forward? It might, in ways I can't even imagine. But it's not obvious to me that my talking to Hugo is going to move. And so is an hour and a half, which is, for me, a lot of time, or am I actually better doing an experiment? It's, I mean, I, again, I don't want to suggest that PLAN, because we work on it. We have always worked on it. We found the gene. We care. When nobody else was working on it, we were working on it. But we're always trying to decide, even within experiments, we have so many questions. But we don't pursue certain questions because the answer isn't going to get us to a therapeutic. It's interesting, but it's not going to get us to a therapeutic. We try to stay really focused on the goals. It's just it's about making choices all along the way. Can I add, I don't know if it's helpful, but it's, you know, it seems like really good ideas come out of people getting together, and it's often fortuitous, but it tends to happen at meetings and conferences where, you know, people just have a chance conversation, um, and it's, that time is like kind of precious and set aside from all your other work, and I think that allows it to happen, where it's like, yeah, I've got, you know, three days, my family's not here, and I can just talk to a bunch of people, and I feel like that's where a lot of this collaboration stems from. And it's hard to like create that on a day-to-day -day basis when you, you kind of go back to your world and then you take those ideas and move forward. And um, so I think they do happen, those conversations, but they're um, kind of more in set uh, designated times. And so I, you know, I kind of like the idea of having MBA disorders be a little bit more prominent in bigger meetings like you know Child Neurology Society where a lot of young pediatric neurologists who are you know, trying to develop their careers in research, come and just learn, and it might be a good, you know, place or other meetings like AAN or one of those to have like a symposium on MBIA and kind of create some of those uh, opportunities for collaboration. Yeah, that's a very good point. So we, we are missing a, a coordinator for all the, no, but yeah. to be honest, I'm so, I'm, I'm serious, but I'm not gonna, uh, but, but this is really my feeling, <coughs> but as a, a French uh, man, I'm uh, in contact with Jean Louvasseur, mm -hmm. uh, that you, you know, he say hello, yes, actually. <laughs> uh, so um, as soon as I met him and I discussed with him, uh, I, I got a, a pretty clear vision of, uh, of the world of mm -hmm. NBIA and PILAN, and of yeah. course with uh, Lina and Anil. Yeah. 
also. And, and today, I think we have, as, as parents, uh, we have a clear vision of what's going on. And we have the feeling that there's a lot of happening in, in different places, but we are missing so, uh, uh, some coordination. And, and exactly, I think, uh, what uh, very, uh, Hugo Belen was very surprised. And we were, I think, even shocked or surprised ourselves to see him surprised of what he has discovered on the, on the Leo's fibroblast when he tried the desipramine. And uh, we were thinking, yeah, I think it's a very important uh, information to share for which purpose, for which results, we don't know, but uh, for the other parents. So actually, bon, I have an answer today, but uh, my feeling, or I, I kind of understood that you were, you, Susanne Flick, uh, kind of the coordinator, I understand not. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I don't. It's it's an idea. Is it possible to have to create a, um, to to have someone who is coordinating all the people like you, Belen, uh, Katzbauer, Kurian, uh, Monjo that we've been in contact to also. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I'm an architect, <laughs> and and that's my everyday work. Yeah. And I know that most of the problem is uh, missing coordination. Yeah. And even if you have the, the most smartest, uh, nicest, greatest yeah. architect, if yeah. there's no coordination, there's yeah. no project. Coordination and communication. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the floors actually are six inches off. Yeah, and, and, yeah. Ju and just to finish, well, we cannot help you on research as parents. Uh, we, we understand a little bit, but uh, so we cannot help you on that. But what we, we, we told in our email is the, what we can do and also because you don't have time, we don't have a lot of time either, but we can help for coordination to share information. Um, that's something we can help. I think there's, a, I would like maybe after that we discuss this point, uh, which appears to us uh, to be very important. And I had a long discussion with Jean-Louis Vasseur also about the biobank and everything. But what happened with, uh, with Belen uh, during the, the conference? Uh, we, it's clear that the, the, to provide fibroblast uh, to everybody seems to be very important. Each time we ask uh, to Hugo Belen, we ask Orion Manjou, we ask, uh, we're going to talk uh, later uh, to Alcazar in Spain. Everybody told us, yeah, uh, we, as much as we have, it's, uh, it's, it's our material to work. Yeah. So yeah. that's also, so, so we, can, we can help the, the, the parents, the association. Here we are, of course, you know, there's in IQ with Lina and Anil. We are representing uh, AI, uh, yeah. AI DNA with Jean Louis Vasseur, who is yeah. still working. Yeah. So just tell us how can we help? Yeah, so I, I don't have the answer, but I will give that some thought. Um, yeah, I, w I will give that some thought and round back with you. Uh, Sucheta had, had something uh, to add. I was just going to make some comments, uh, kind of rounding out what uh, a lot of people have been saying. So there are a lot of ways that we communicate within medical uh, communities. Uh, Dr. Wilson mentioned, uh, you know, talking whether it's formally or informally at scientific meetings, and that's really where a lot of people are together for in a sort of concentrated dose of each other, so to speak, for those three or four days. Uh, within the child neurology community, and this is kind of a mishmash of clinicians, basic scientists, trainees, uh, junior people, mid-level faculty, everybody, uh, there are email lists and listservs where we exchange a lot of information and they're precisely used for the kind of questions that families ask us. I have a family with this rare diagnosis. Does anybody know of who is doing cutting edge work in this field? And I'm often surprised to see how much I learn from just reading that email every day. Uh, there are several of the foundations have booths at uh, scientific meetings, mm -hmm. and that's another wonderful place to get information out. Um, 
people are stopping by, whether it's for the candy or for the pen or for the wristband, but that is a great way to get the information out. Uh, so the Child Neurology Society meeting happens once a year. There is, um, you know, if we were this morning talking about coordinating care even with general pediatricians, because they often see these, um, see a lot of these kids mm -hmm. far more frequently in the early years before a specialist gets involved. So there are many, many avenues through which this information can be disseminated. And I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I take care of children with epilepsy and some really rare epilepsies. So we're talking about you know one or two kids, maybe even in a lifetime career or fi in five or ten years. So I I learn from my families. When uh, when families bring information to me saying, hey, I heard this through such and such a source. Um, we will often you know even if it does not make complete intuitive sense to us the first time when we hear it. Uh, most of us are happy to go back and say, you know, let me at least look into what you're talking about. And I think it's our job as stewards of your children's health to say, this makes sense. Yes, you should pursue this. This does not make sense. Here is what I think why. So I think that communication back to your doctors is really important. Thank you. I'm just going to add a couple of things to what was just said, because I think that's really valuable that you are teaching us a lot, because a lot a lot of your doctors have not met another child or another family going through what you're going through. So you are teaching them, this, you're teaching them more than just the science about your child. And the one thing that we do when we see rare children with rare conditions is that we do make the effort in the background after hours and things to look up what you've provided us, but also look up stuff from other sources to try to keep up to date with these things. And also, if I have a family that says, look, there's a study I found out through social media through about, you know, that's happening for me. I'm in Canada, so a lot of them are happening in the States. I actually connect with that physician and say, I don't know much about this condition. I understand you. Can you send me some info to make sure that it is actually a good study for you to get involved in? Because sometimes not all studies are the same, right? So we want to make sure we're protecting your child. And so not to give you permission to be part of it. You're allowed to be part of anything you want, but try to give you, provide you some guidance from the scientific perspective. But I think we are all open to these things and we want to provide the best care for your child. So we will make that effort behind the scenes to look out for them. Something like P-Line, is, it, it's rare, but I think what's happening in the community, people are becoming more aware through meetings, um, through our own institutions, with people being interested with that, you know, grassroots, it's kind of growing from like many, many different um, areas. We are distributing, distributing information to our own colleagues, to our own trainees, to a lot of people ourselves. So it's, it's being, it's, there's some growth happening. Um, so I know it's not one network, but I think there are a lot of people that are kind of spreading to hope to provide a network for you. Thank you. Um, so we're coming around on the, the, the timing. Are there any other topics? I'd like to give Allison a little bit of time to talk about PLAN Ready, which has been uh, one of the projects that our group has been working on. Um, as you know, the Readies, PCAN Ready, BPAN Ready, have been, uh, they're not very, exciting studies, right? But the FDA, <laughs> the, well, Allison. Yeah. Try not to take that first. Sorry, <laughs> the, but they, they, they are in, 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 in that we, we know that they're critically important, that the um, therapeutics in, in development can't go forward without them. And so we are uh, working, so Manju Korean's done a, a historical retrospective analysis of uh, a large number of cases, and we've uh, got a prospective analysis to add to that um, that is ongoing, but just give Allison a chance to talk about that a bit. Thank you. Sorry, it's just right here. There we go. Better? Ah. Um, most of you know this study from doing it, um, and if you have little kiddos, you do it at three-month intervals, so I think the hardest thing about this study is it's kind of a grind because you probably feel like you just finished it and then you get another email from us. Um, and the reason we designed it that way is, as you know, especially for INAD, for the infantile form, 
kids kind of gain, 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 maybe hold steady for a bit and start to lose on the other side. And to capture that trajectory, we really felt like the three month intervals were important. Um, so thank you for doing that over and over again. I know it gets a little redundant, but we do think it's important. Um, and the other thing I should point out about it is every time you do another one of those three or six month inputs for us, you're giving us more statistical power. And that's really important because INAD is so, and PLAN are so ultra rare that because I can't get 100 people in the study, the more intervals you do, I'm making up statistical power that way. So it's, we're coming up on two years for this study. I think at the meeting two years ago in Chicago, we were just launching. So we have 19 participants with the infantile form, seven, the sort of early enrollees have four or more, some up to seven um, visits at those three month intervals. Two families have enrolled and uploaded information about children who had already passed away when we launched the study. So that's actually been, I think it was helpful for them and helpful for us. They really wanted to contribute and we found a way for them to do that by doing sort of a one-time um, data upload for us of how their children were doing you know, near the end of their life. But we also were able to get medical records from earlier on to have comparison points to show the trajectory of, of where they were headed. Um, we have eight juvenile onset participants, so the more, uh, maybe a little bit later onset, more slowly moving form, three of them have four or more visits now. They're at six month intervals because they don't move as rapidly as the, the little children do, so we were able to space that out a little bit more. Um, for most of you, some in other countries it's been trickier, but we're receiving information from both a, a parent or a caretaker as well as a physical therapist. And the therapists have been really helpful because there are some things that we just didn't feel comfortable asking you about, like in terms of commenting specifically on dystonia versus spasticity versus rigidity versus hypotonia. Some of those things where a physical therapist who actually has their hands on your kids can comment um, at the same three-month intervals and give us additional data. And again, it bumps up our power because now we're getting data from two different places um, at those intervals. So we just in January signed a contract with Lena and INAD Cure to help fund, um, well really to completely fund a feasibility study for the data that we have to date. We have collaborators at Washington State University um, in Eastern Washington and they use a statistical method that's kind of new um, latent growth curves to analyze this type of data. And the feasibility study, more than anything, is to show them our current data set. Um, everything's de-identified, so they don't have names, dates of birth, anything. It's just the raw data that we've cleaned up a little bit for them. But doing a study to say, OK, here's how it looks. We're going to group things in certain ways, sort of they call it building a model. And they'll build it several different ways and analyze it. But to see, do we have the statistical power to um, to get meaningful information from this data to show the trajectory of INAD, to show how it changes over time, so that when we are ready to do an intervention with something like Manju's Gene Therapy Project, we've already got all this stuff in place. We're ready, and we know that we have good outcome measures and that we can have a reliable outcome measure that will um, give us a signal, like Susan said. Um, so we collaborate with Manju closely on this. She has a retrospective study in place for PLAN as well. So we've shared all our de-identified data with Manju um, the retrospective data, meaning the stuff that goes back in time, then ours is prospective, which is ideal. It's much more difficult to collect. But between the two, we feel like we've got those bases covered pretty well. Um, so my biggest challenge, our biggest challenge, has really been getting people to enroll in this study, and I'm not sure why that is. I feel like, yeah, Matt? Um, sorry. On uh, the uh, Facebook group, um, there has been some concern about um, international uh, patients enrolling in it. Um, are there still hurdles? What um, can we do to So help what we've tried to do is sort of do a modified version for them because trying to get a physical therapist in a completely different language to give us some of this data is really tough. So I've been on that part. Um, some of the scales that you all do, you know, um, like the infant and toddler quality of life scale you might recognize or some of the things like depression, anxiety scales, those are also hard if English, if they're not pretty proficient in English, I just start to worry about the quality of the data, what's lost in translation. But I think that at least some of the basics we can collect from them. So we've been doing that 
whenever I felt it was possible with if they have someone helping them who's fluent in English or if they're fluent in English themselves as a second language, then we've been making it work. Um, there have been a few cases where somebody is just, it's just not working, <laughs> and I can tell that. But we've had to kind of say, okay, we're, we're gonna take a pause for now, but we've been trying, because it's an ultra rare disorder, we're trying to not turn anybody away. Um, I mean, honestly, my frustration has been, I see on the Facebook group, there are plenty of people in the US who aren't participating it, in it, even people who have come to see us at clinic at OHSU, and um, I try not to take that personally, but it's hard for me to understand what the barriers are. And I don't know if it's the grind of doing it every three months. I don't know if it's hard answering these questions. You know, they're not really feel-good questions. They're hard questions. Um, but I feel like I've kind of maximized what I can do to pump up that enrollment, and I would love to hear if you all have other ideas about that, because I feel like the people who are in it are all in. They're doing a fantastic job. They're reliable. They're doing it every three months. I would love to get a few more. Um, and in the meantime, the feasibility study is underway. Um, I actually felt really good when I gave them the data because we have so many data points from people, plus really early records that adds a lot of power. Um, so I don't think, yeah, I think we're gonna get good news with the feasibility study, but if we could get more people, that would be really good. So is there something you could do uh, for the community to, to get? I would love to think so, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I'm I mean not what, sure what we'll do with that if it will help. Well, if, if you know, yeah, yeah. Public shame. Talk to them. <laughs> yeah. I, I cannot public shame. Yeah. You know, so the translation thing is is seems uh, kind of straightforward, but there are, there are the validation of the tool. It actually has to be it has to be forward and reverse translated, and and still there are questions about validity of the tool. So we don't we haven't had uh, a mechanism to support uh, uh, translators in all those languages, in all those directions. And so again, it's about priorities and, and what, we can, what we can do. We simply haven't had the resources to do that. Um, but about and saying that there's a lot of people yes, here that yes. aren't participating. Well, I would say if you were on the Facebook group I'm, and you wagged a finger at them, I'm pretty sure they'd be doing it. <laughs> can can you can you get her like live 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 Facebook live like with your with your with your the big sunglasses you have you are kind of intimidating when you walk up to some like like I'm your mother you gonna you gonna fill out on that buddy I'm your mother I'm your mother totally well the thing is ethically I cannot. I cannot publicly shame, or you know, I can't be aggressively recruiting people on the Facebook group or other places. I have no I problem. Need but you can. But you no can. problem. No, I don't. Can we get a force? No, no, of course not. not. Of course not. And neither can I. But I think it's more, it's more, it's always the same thing. It's about to make people understand. But, but I mean, every parent here uh, know that, and, and we discover pretty soon that a lot of parents just give up pretty quickly. I think that uh, well, for the reason we all yes. know, and yeah. of course we know more than anybody, uh, and, and and I respect that and I understand. But uh, through the the, the face group, uh, um, the, the face the Facebook group, actually uh, it took me time to go on it. Uh, I was impressed to see that it was 200 people. Yeah. Um, wow. And which is a lot, yeah. and and I think it's going to be a discussion with Lina, but we are discussing a lot. But for me, and the same thing for the fibroblast, uh, because we've been discussing the the, the 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 thing about the fibroblast. For me, it's not about you have to do it, but we we push you to do it, and and the reason are those. Yeah. Why, why, to explain why this is important. Yeah. We, we have, I think, all the people here, all the parents here are involved. We are here, we took the time, we come from Paris, we are flying here, uh, we want to be involved. I'm, I'm spending a lot of time with uh, Jean Louvasseur in France, uh, with Spain, with, uh, bon. it, it's, it's a choice, and I understand that some parents don't want to do it, cannot do it, and everything, but this is, I think, our own. Uh, as member of foundation of uh, uh, association and everything, to explain to other parents why it's important yeah. and to just push them if they don't want to do it. Yeah. So 
we will we, discuss that later, but yeah. I think we, through the, the Facebook. We uh, would appreciate your t taking a role. I mean, I, I know you have, but taking a continuing sure. role in trying to encourage that because it is one tangible action ongoing, albeit, that families can take to, to lay essential found work, groundwork, and nobody else, I mean, nobody else will do that. Well, and yeah. it's true that it may not benefit them directly. It will benefit the community undoubtedly. I don't know when, but it will. Can I add something? Yes. Um, uh, I'm from the Netherlands, and um, it wasn't really clear who enrolled in the PECON. It, we're mostly doing stuff for PECON. Um, so, and the mothers got together uh, in like the Facebook Messenger group, and then I asked someone to post uh, a message to uh, enroll in the PECON study, and I, I give permission for me to call all the mothers. So I called all the mothers that hadn't, hadn't enrolled yet, uh, both in the Netherlands and in Belgium, and that really got them going, at least I hope, Alison. Well, we have some in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the, the really personal approach, and I asked them, is there anything I can do? I will come to your house, and we will yeah. sit, and I will help you. Maybe that will help as well, um, if there's the possibility, of course, yeah. for you. But it's really the personal approach, and also they feel seen, and also that they know where to go, where to find help. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So L'Oreal had a comment, and then I think I'm going to wrap, wrap us up. It was just again to support um, international history studies. So I work. Uh, so I work in gene therapy, not on PLAN, but um, for PCAN. Not yet on PLAN. Not yet on PLAN. <laughs> but it sounds like there are already people working on it, so I don't, you know, I don't have to jump right in, so and interrupt their stuff. Um, but the natural history studies are really important for the FDA, especially when it comes to things like gene therapy, because we don't do double-blind placebo-controlled studies in gene therapy. And so when someone receives a treatment, you're really comparing their outcomes based on a natural history. So if you don't have good natural history, you don't know if the treatment's working. And especially if you start to see, um, you know, if the gene therapy is maybe better than not having it, but it's not like 100% recovery, but if it's helpful, you really need to be able to compare that to where you would expect a child to be at. And so even for, um, if you're trying to convince people to join, just saying, if, trying to point out to them that the direct benefit is if there ever is a drug or a treatment for a child, that these, they're going to be comparing against these natural histories to know that it's working. And so we need that data to know that anything we develop is going to actually be helpful. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much for that. So um, I, I think I may have said it to this group. Sorry, you're the third in a, a, what's been a fairly long day for us. Um, we're going to be here for a couple of days. Um, there's a lot of time for us to spend one-on-one -on -one with you answering your questions. And so I encourage you to meet the early career. Uh, physicians, teach them about your children. Come talk to me. Ask me your questions. But today, it's been a really long day for us. We started at 8.30, we've been going almost nonstop. And it would be um, a gift to us to talk to you probably starting tomorrow.